This is Apollo 5, the first all-up unmanned flight test for the lunar module, the spacecraft in which man will make his first landing on the moon, the final major piece of Apollo hardware to be tested. Now the lunar module, dubbed LM-1, sits in its protective technological cocoon atop the tested and proven Saturn 1B launch vehicle, waiting for the boost into the environment for which it was designed, space. It will not return to Earth, but will continue in a gradually decaying orbit until it re-enters and burns up. In the blockhouse at Cape Kennedy, the men have assembled to do the job. From Marshall Space Flight Center, from the Kennedy Space Center, and from the Manned Spacecraft Center, they have come to get the mission into orbit. RTC, will you site select, Guido, GNC, and ECOM to Milo. In mission control in Houston, flight controllers wait to take over command of the mission as soon as it lifts off the pad. Among these men are four who watch with special interest. Astronauts Jim McDivitt and Rusty Schweikert, who are scheduled to fly the first manned lunar module. And in a support room next to the control room, astronauts Frank Borman and Bill Anders, who will fly the lunar module on its rehearsal of the first manned lunar mission. Go flight. GNC. Go flight. Procedures. Go flight. AFD. Go. Network. Go flight. Computer suit. Go flight. RTC on AFD conference. RTC is on AFD conference. Roger. Best of luck. Okay, go ahead and reload. All flight controllers preconditioned for attachment two of the internal count. So men wait in tracking stations around the world for the flight of Lunar Module Number 1, for it is their information that will tell us whether it is safe for man. But what is this craft called the Lunar Module? LM uh, is a vehicle that has been designed for a particular job, and that job is to land on the lunar surface. It, uh, it doesn't look like an airplane or a spacecraft uh, in the old sense. It's not smooth. It's very thin skin, has a descent propulsion uh, stage, a large descent engine which will be used to, to land the vehicle on the lunar surface uh, in a manner very similar to that of a helicopter, except that instead of using uh, blades for a lift, we'll be using a rocket propulsion engine. And uh, the upper stage, the cabin and ascent engine stage, uh, will be used to lift off from the lunar surface and uh, make the subsequent rendezvous with the command and service module. So the LIM is really the, the taxi that provides the transportation between the orbiting command module and the lunar surface. The lunar module is a unique engineering concept. Designed and built on Earth, it is out of place on its native planet. The airless surface of the moon, the empty reaches of space, this is where it belongs. The comfortable pull of Earth's gravity, the protective, life-giving atmosphere, these, to the lunar module, nicknamed LEM, are the hostile elements. Its engines cannot lift its own weight against the pull of the Earth. If it could fly on Earth, the aerodynamic forces of the atmosphere would tear it apart. So how do you test the lunar module before it flies in space? You test its engines in the man-made vacuum of an engine test stand its operating systems in gigantic vacuum chambers. You tumble it on stands in engineering laboratories. But the real test is when it flies. Roger, I am in flight control. Final status check, booster. Go, retro, go, Fido, go, guide, go, ECOM, go. While the primary instructions for the mission are carried on board the LEM, the men on Earth in mission control can take over and fly it if necessary. But why all these elaborate precautions and details in an unmanned flight? Unmanned LEM-1 mission is one of the key missions in the entire, entire lunar landing program. You must remember that the LEM is every bit as important as spacecraft as the command module, the Gemini, or the Mercury was, and this is the first flight of the vehicle. Naturally, uh, we'll all be looking at it with uh, very, very keen interest. Flight CVTS Black 2, verify your go for launch. Roger, we are go for launch. Okay, all flight controllers, let's play it cool. Launch sequence start. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 
Five enter. Clock start. Five enter. Trust OK. Affirmative. Program 11. OK, TLK P11. Roll pitch start. Roll and pitch. Go on IP. Go IP. Stand by for nose. The launch and insertion into Earth orbit are on the nose. The aerodynamic shroud is jettisoned. Now the next critical step, the opening of the protective metallic petals and the separation of Lunar Module 1 from its cocoon. RTC booster, transmitting slot deploy. Roger. We are transmitting slot deploy. Okay, all flight controllers, we have slot deploy A and B relay indications, no physical monitor indication. Everything is nominal. We get a go for separation. On schedule, the reaction control engines of Lunar Module 1 pull it free of its protective cocoon. The space butterfly rests its wings before it flies. Now begins the long coast preparatory to the first firing of the descent engine. While the LEM coasts, tracking stations pinpoint its position and determine its orbit with accuracy. In Houston Mission Control, engineers are testing the many systems on board. The limb, I think, is like a big uh, line of dominoes, every one of which uh, has an effect upon the uh, one it's associated with. And nothing uh, can occur in one that doesn't somehow affect the others or the total uh, mission. So LEM-1 coasts on, guided by its onboard programmer, seen only by the radar eyes of the tracking network, watched over by the men in mission control. We will not pulse the engine. And the maneuver is go at this time based on the onboard. Roger, Houston. Roger, Houston is go for the burn. The lunar module nears the Australian coast. The Carnarvon tracking station takes command. The time is nearing for the first burn of the descent engine, the first rocket engine designed to be throttled, a necessary feature for a lunar landing. This will be its first burn in space. Dips on. Dips on. 10%. 10%. We got a ping caution. Program caution. Roger. Dips off. But something goes wrong. Instead of the full 38 second burn, the engine shuts down after only four seconds. An early look at the data indicates the onboard computer did not allow for the tolerances and errors within this most complex of all missions. It shut down the descent engine when it sensed an error of less than one and a half seconds. And computers don't argue. The capability of a crew, I think, is uh, very uh, significant in that you don't, you can, uh, you can change your mind in flight. Uh, you don't have to uh, be restricted by the uh, rather narrow capabilities of any pre-programmed uh, mission. Faced with the unexpected, the computer made the only decision it could, and it was the wrong one. Now the success of the mission rests squarely on the team in mission control and in the tracking stations. The nominal plan is out the window. On communications lines all over the world, the alternates are discussed. But the final word must come from flight director Gene Kranz. I guess our best plan here, and I think the way we're going to go, go ahead, is alternate Charlie. Go ahead. In the attitude you've got. Go ahead. At 6.15 elapsed. Go ahead. The long throttle burn of the descent engine would be cut to two minutes and occur during its pass over the United States. Then the descent engine would go to 100% thrust preparatory for the biggest test of the mission, fire in the hole. Let's suppose that we're descending using the descent engine and suddenly we discover some fault in the descent or the ascent stage for that matter. Well, we would like to return to a safe lunar orbit. So what we would do is essentially abort fire the ascent stage while it's still connected to the descent stage, and then milliseconds later, fire the pyros that separate the two stages. 
Roger, you have Dip's arm. Are uh, we showing the ignition to screen? We show first chamber pressure. First chamber pressure is gone. We are burning the rates are good. It's a good burn. We go. Over California now, up and down the power scale. The first rocket engine capable of controlled variations of its propulsion force is passing the test. This is the time of maximum stress on the lunar module and on the men, flight controllers, astronauts, and engineers, to whom Lunar Module One represents years of their professional lives. And now there is another factor. A second test for the ascent stage is a burn to depletion of its propellant. This was to come one orbit after fire in the hole to test the restart capability of the engine. Now, if it looks critical, this burn will be combined with fire in the hole. Max first. Raj. Watch stage. Staging. Raj, staging. Apps on. Okay, let's watch this. We got 60 seconds. Let's make a good go now. Go here. Flight fighter, we're looking at White Sands track. It is good. It's solid. We're go. The burn is good. Lunar Module 1 is performing fantastically well as a spacecraft. The shutdown order is given after 60 seconds of ascent burn. Now it is time for the burn to depletion. However, as the Lunar Module continues its flight, the Earth has rotated under it until it has moved nearly off the tracking range. LAM-1 will now pass over only one station, Hawaii, that can give the new and accurate information its computer needs and can command the engine to restart. It looks like on the coming pass, Hawaii will send the update and on the next, send the command signal. But now another problem crops up. Flight, we're going to run out of RCS and B here the way we're going. Okay, Jack, let's stay cool. Because of the new mode of flight, the attitude rockets are running low on propellant. It looks as though these small but critical engines may not last for two more orbits. But an update of orbit information shows that Lunar Module 1 will just pass within range of the Carnarvon Station, whose range has been extended by the addition of the tracking ship Coastal Sentry Quebec, CSQ. Flight Director Kranz makes his decision. Update at Carnarvon and fire at Hawaii. It's go for the burn. Guidance from flight, we're having a lot of dropouts. Roger, flight. Ecom, let him know when he's clear to command again. Go. But the pass over Carnarvon is too short. The full update does not get to the lunar module, including an instruction that would have drained some of the propellant from the ascent engine tanks into the tanks of the attitude rockets. Without this propellant, it is doubtful if the final ascent burn can be ignited. Now it gets tight. Tank pressure is just enough. It has to be this orbit. The flight team is under the gun. Cran's plan is time critical. The rest of the information will be sent up early during the Hawaii pass. After a quick guidance check, the ascent propulsion system will be fired. The signal to ignite the engine is PRA-5. You have clock and compare pulses. That's negative, flight. We got a spacecraft reject on that. We don't show any clock compare pulses, flight. Retransmit. Guidance, execute PRA start. It's go. The burn works. And at shutdown, it holds. All systems are still operating as expected, beyond what was expected. It's been a tremendous test of the engine, and that's what it was all about. Do you want me to stand by here? Negative, you've done it all, and good work, Gary. Beautiful job. Throughout the flight of Apollo 5, the lunar module had performed magnificently. All systems operated either as predicted or far exceeded the predictions. The inability of an onboard computer to cope with a programming error was overcome by the infinitely more flexible mind of man. Hundreds of additional commands sent from Earth put the lunar module through a demanding real-time test. So Lunar Module 1 tumbles on through space, its orbit decaying mathematically until it is destroyed by the atmosphere of an Earth on which it was created, but to which it cannot return. Lunar Module 1 was the first, the first space test of a manned vehicle designed to explore another world. This was the flight of the machine. Soon it will be time for man.